This is uh, episode 55, live from my drum room. I want to thank everybody who's been watching uh, on YouTube, the other shows that I've done um, that have been, you know, my Remembering Charlie Watts episodes. I did, um, I've done a couple by myself where I sort of paid tribute to Charlie. And then uh, the last two episodes, 53 and 54, have been uh, Remembering Charlie with a number of um, old friends and special guests that, you know, if you haven't seen them, please go into my YouTube channel or you can download the podcasts uh, in all the different places, all the different platforms. But I mean, people like Chad Smith, Steve Smith, Steve Gadd, Andy Newmark, um, Kenny Aronoff, Dave Maddox, Stan Lynch, John Ferraro, Steve Maxwell, Don McCauley, of course, Charlie's Drum Tech. Um, Clem Burke, I mean, Sean Pelton, a whole bunch of great drummers and friends have um, joined me to remember Charlie. And I have a couple more of these Remembering Charlie shows scheduled. Um, they won't be live, but, um, but upcoming guests include uh, Jim Keltner, Max Weinberg, Simon Kirk. Uh, I'm hoping to get a few other guys. Oh, I should mention Kenny Jones also was on one of my previous shows. Uh, very important guest to not overlook by any means. Um, but yeah, so I have some upcoming shows remembering Charlie with, uh, with some, some more big name guests. So be on the lookout for those. Uh, but today, today I have Richard King, who I've known for a number of years. And Richard uh, is a, an old friend of Charlie's as well. In fact, I first became aware of who he was, who he is, through uh, Chooch McGee, Charlie's um, late drum tech, the great Chooch McGee. And he used to talk about Richard, at, you know, he was a great source for a bunch of Charlie's vintage drums and hardware and, you know, all sorts of things um, that Chooch and Charlie bought from Richard over the years. And he's, a, you know, continues to be a great source for vintage drums. And um, Richard and I were talking the other day and we had this idea to do this show about Charlie's drums. And uh, as best we could, and I, and I, I do want to say, um, you know, that this is, hey, Todd, good to see you, man. Uh, this is, we, we both want to make this clear. And I, and I know when Richard comes on with me, he'll say this as well, that uh, we're absolutely not saying that this is the gospel truth. We're just basing this on the information that we have available and that, you know, that's sort of out there. There's still a lot of mysteries out there regarding Charlie's, especially his symbols, Charlie's drums. But we're hoping to just open a discussion with all you guys. Uh, and maybe some folks out there watching like Todd Little can, can chime in and uh, who have some knowledge on, on his drums and cymbals as well. And we can, you know, open this discussion and we can all learn something from it. I, I'm still learning right up until the last time, you know, I spoke with Charlie, I was still learning things because he, he give me little tidbits, little morsels of information. I think he, he uh, enjoyed torturing me with um never giving me too much information because he knew that I'd just keep asking for more and more. Um, and I, and I was telling Richard this morning off the air that I kind of knew when to dial it back with him because I'd, I'd kind of get to that point where I'd really be going, but Charlie, what about, you know, on sticky fingers, what was that ride symbol in dead flowers, you know, and he'd be like, Oh, I don't know, you know, and I never wanted to be that guy, you know, of, of like pushing it that far. So, um, Anyway, it's nice to see uh, a good, good amount of folks watching here. I also want to mention, uh, if you don't already know, but I have to think you do know that I started, if you're watching this on Facebook, you have to know that I started a Facebook group called the Charlie Watts Appreciation Group. Um, if you don't know about it, it's, uh, it's free to join right now. I'm going to charge, start charging uh, an admission in 2022. So your best bet is to join now for free while there's no uh, fee. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's, it's very simple. We all are there to pay tribute and honor Charlie. So, uh, so if you don't already know about it and you haven't joined, please, please do join the group. It's a fun group. A lot of great folks there. A lot of great discussions a lot of really deep minutia about Charlie's drums. And uh, before I bring Richard on, I'm, I'm doing this 
completely by the, by the seat of my pants today. I have no notes. I made no notes at all today. I meant to. I had a crazy morning. I had a panic phone call from my friend ben, Billy Amendola from Modern Drummer Magazine last night, uh, needing something from me this morning, which I spent the morning on. And uh, I had intended to jot some things down. So I don't know. I'm probably going to forget to talk about a lot of stuff. That's why I got my friend Richard here to help me. Going to let him sort of drive this. But I do want to show you what's behind me here in my drum room. I kind of have my uh, evolution, as it were, of Charlie's Gretsch drum sets, as close as I can get anyway. And if you look behind me, in that corner, that is a round badge. Um, it's a 1962 round badge, Black Diamond Pearl Gretsch drum set. Now, it turns out Charlie's Black Diamond Pearl kit, we've recently discovered that it's a stop sign badge from 1969. So I thought all along it was a round badge kit because it was from 69 and that was, they were still making the round badge drums that year. But it turns out um, Charlie's kit was actually a stop sign badge. Who'd have thunk it? But anyway, that's my Black Diamond Pearl kit, very similar to Charlie's. It's exact same sizes. Next to that is my Pride and Joy Black Nitron early 70s stop sign badge Black Nitron Gretsch kit. Whoops. You see that? Set up right handed in Charlie's honor. That's all original stuff. Chrome over brass snare drum. Again, 13, 16 toms, 22 inch bass drum. And last is my maple uh, early 70s, or actually, I think it could be a 69 or 70. It's a stop sign badge maple Gretsch kit. Um, with a 13 inch Tom, Charlie, of course, has a 12 inch Tom on his kit. That's for all you Gretsch Charlie nerds. Um, so anyway, that's my sort of evolution. Those are three of my seven Gretsch drum sets, uh, but three that kind of, um, you know, pay tribute to Charlie for lack of a better way of saying it, but uh, three kits that he has been seen using through the years uh, in those in those different colors. So anyway, um, now that we got that out of the way, again, I wanna thank everybody for watching today. It's good to see you folks. And uh, I'll see if I can remember how to do this live. So without further ado or delay, I'm gonna bring on my guest, my friend, Richard King. The vintage expert. And there he is. Welcome, Richard King. Hey, everybody. All right. Thanks. It's good to see you, pal. Thanks for thanks for being here. And thanks for doing this today and and uh, and sharing all your knowledge and information and history with of Charlie with us and and uh, We're both speechless. I know. Me too. <laughs> uh, I've been I've been going on and on, you know, for a couple of minutes here. So I don't know if you're watching it, but I was, you know, just oh, yeah. Well, I, I apologize for the blabbing. I'll I'll cut most of this stuff out. So <laughs> all good stuff. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to um I wanted to just sort of hand it over to you, Richard, and and um and have you kind of lead the discussion on, um, on first of all, you know, how you, how you came to know Charlie when you first, you know, sort of met him in Chooch and kind of start with your history. Okay. Uh, it's very, uh, it's a very odd story because um, I was working at a music store in 1989 called master musicians. And uh, one of the salesmen called, you know, called me on the intercom and said, Hey, there's a guy that says he's from the Rolling Stones on the phone. And I'm like, you have got to be kidding, you know, and, uh, and it was Chooch McGee. And, uh, I think you have a picture of Chooch I sent to you, John. Uh, I do. Find... Yeah. Yep. Let me find that. Um... I'll continue on with the story while you put that photo up. Uh, right. Chooch was, uh, the, um, the drum tech for Charlie Watts. He originally started his job or his career with the stones as the uh, guitar tech for Ronnie Woods. Uh, he came on board in 1975 and basically just did the guitars for Ronnie Woods. And I think sometimes he would hand Mick Jagger his guitars. Uh, in uh, 1985, uh, 
by that point, uh, Chooch had been with the Stones for 10 years. In 1985, Ian Stewart passed away. And uh, all through the 60s and into the 70s and into the 80s, Ian Stewart, who was considered the, uh, the, the sixth Rolling Stone and played piano with the band, he was the one that set up everything. He brought all the equipment in and the, set the drums up for Charlie. And that was that. And, uh, and he basically handled all the, all the gear for the band. And um, in 1985, unfortunately, he passed away from a heart attack and it was a great loss to the band. So at that point, Chooch became by de facto or default, I mean, uh, the, the uh, drum tech for Charlie Watts. And Chooch didn't play guitar for first of, all, first of all, and second of all, he didn't play drums. So he got these jobs just because he was just incredibly reliable and a real hard worker. And all the guys in the band loved him. Yeah, Ronnie Wood brought him on and they just all fell in love with Chooch. He was just such a, a personality. And, and John got to meet him on, on a couple of occasions as well. And uh, Chooch was the guy that had to get everything, you know, for the Stones. He would have to go around calling people for guitar strings and this and that. Uh, prior to that, uh, Ian Stewart would show up at music stores around the country and uh, buy the guitar picks or strings or drum heads. And, and John uh, had his own experience meeting Ian Stewart at one point at the music store he worked at. That's and right. uh, yeah, yeah that's, they just had, that was their job. And they would, you know, they would get the call, you know, the guys would say, hey, we need some strings, we need this and that. And they would go into the local music store or wherever that was. And, and that's what they would do. So Chooch became a reluctant but happy uh, uh, guy to do the job for, um, for the Stones, and he took over and did a, just an amazing job. So in 1989, uh, the Stones had been on break for about four or five years or something like that, and uh, they decided that they were going to do a new world tour, which at that time was called the Steel Wheels World World Tour. And uh, Chooch had called all these music stores all around the country, and the last store that he had called before he called me was a uh, drums on uh, drum headquarters in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and he talked to a guy named Rob Burnbound, and yeah. Rob referred uh, master musicians to uh, to him and gave him the phone number. And then Chooch called me up and um, he said, and he had a very graspy voice. Hey, Rich, uh, my name is Chooch McGee. I work for the Rolling Stones and I need a, I need a bass drum. And I was like, you know, he had called everybody in the country. And nobody had, they wanted another Gretsch bass drum. And um and I lied. I basically, I said, I didn't, I was, I saw an opportunity and I was like, wow, it's Rolling Stones, man. And we had, you know, Master Musicians at that time was one of two of the biggest, there was only a few vintage drum shops in the world at that time. We were one or two of them in the United States. It was us and the uh, Vintage Drum Center in Iowa. And uh, so I was like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> and so uh, we had a couple of scrap, you know, just old Gretsch drums lying around. And we had one in a, a champagne sparkle that was just a nice stock Gretsch bass drum. And uh, we sent it to a gentleman in, uh, in uh, Atlanta at a, a drum shop called Atlanta Pro Percussion, a guy named Ward Wilson. And I'm friends with him on, on Facebook. Um, and Ward uh, stripped the, uh, the champagne off, refinished it in maple. And, um, and that was what I was told to do, basically. And then Chooch says, you know, we're going to be in Philadelphia in September. Bring it. I was like, all right, <laughs> you know, I was going to get to a big production like that, you know, so uh, it was crazy. So we got the drum back from uh, from uh, Ward Wilson, screwed all the hardware back together, did a beautiful job, and um, uh, we, we took it up to Philadelphia. And the Rolling Stones were all there doing a outdoor dress rehearsal with all the bombs and the lights and the staging. And I, I don't know if anybody remembers, but the Steel Wheels tour was a massive tour. And this was where they really brought out everything. They wanted to come out and make like a real splash. And they made a huge set with all this scaffolding and lights and snakes and stuff like that and blow up dolls. It was just enormous. And we went there and we're just like, you know, looking at this enormous production, you know, and you could hear the stones in the background banging away on stuff. And we talked to the security guard and they, and they said, hey, we're here with drums. We had all these fiber cases with us. And, uh, and they said, you know, uh, we'll get, you know, go get this guy named Chooch McGee to come and get us. So Chooch came running down and, hey, guys, come on up. You know, so uh, we went up with Chooch, walked up on the back of the stage and uh, pulled all the drums out of the fiber cases because we brought a couple of extra drums to show Charlie, you know, and uh, really didn't think he'd want to buy them. But it was, there were a bunch of Gretches and stuff. And we brought this bass drum out. And uh, what had happened is in 1985, on the last world tour the Stones did, 
they had um, a black bass drum that was used uh, for for many years as a as a back. Well, I'm sorry. Let me take. Let me rewind that. Charlie was playing that Maple Gretsch kit, and the Maple Gretsch kit um, was the only. That's all they had. And mm -hmm. at some point on some show in Europe, Charlie put a bass drum beater through the bass the the batter head and broke that bass drum and uh, and they didn't have a backup. And they didn't have a head either for that matter. And so they lost like about 20 minutes while they took the drum apart and tried to find heads and put it back together because they weren't prepared for that. Charlie never broke drum heads ever. Yeah, yeah. And so they were just completely unprepared for that. Of course, Mick Jagger is just having a cow, you know. And he said that, you know, the next time we go on tour, we want to have a backup bass drum. So when I showed up in Philadelphia, back behind the drum set on a flight case was the, the old Gretsch... Uh, the uh, black bass drum, this one right here. This is the uh, the black nitron bass drum with the uh, uh, little bird logo on the front of it. That was sitting which, in back there. Which I think Charlie drew that, right? Did he? Yes. Did he? Yeah. He sketched that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because it's the same uh, on the uh, more to one Charlie on the album that he made. It's the same little bird, same yeah. design. You know. <laughs> so I saw that bass drum. I was like, I knew exactly what it was. I knew all the history behind that bass drum. That's the bass drum from the drums that he used on rock and roll circus and all that stuff. So I was like, whoa. Right. So that I brought a bass drum that basically was going to replace that bass drum and would just sit back there uh, and be a backup. Over the years, the Stones uh, did some recordings with that bass drum. If you look at the Voodoo Lounge tour, you'll see them recording in the in the hallway of a big staircase. And he's playing that bass drum and a little snare drum on the song, uh, one of the songs on the Voodoo Lounge uh, album. But yeah. I don't remember yeah. right off the So that's how I met Chooch, you know. And it was a very inauspicious beginning. And I thought after we finished that, I said, okay, we're all done. It was a great experience. And I'm glad I, I, I lived and saw it. And I didn't expect any more. But, you know, within a couple of weeks, you know, Chooch is like, hey, Rich, can I need some drumsticks, you know? And it's just one thing after another. He needed drumsticks, drum heads, cymbals. You know, they just, uh, they needed all kinds of stuff because Charlie didn't really endorse anything. He didn't endorse the drum heads. They had, they bought everything they needed, the drum heads, the drumsticks. Uh, yeah. His drumstick of choice was the uh, Ludwig 11S Joe Morello. This is an 11 age of Joe Morello. And, uh, and so I would go out and buy cases of Joe Morello drumsticks and ship them to Chooch. So go figure, you know? <laughs> So yeah, that's that's how I met Chooch and got involved with all that, and did a lot of work for them over the years. Very grateful. Yeah. For them. Well, you know, I was going to say I, I, that's I, I I said this the, before I brought you on. You know, when I met Chooch in '97, so eight years later, yeah. I think one of the first things he said was he he mentioned your name, you know, as being the go-to guy for you know vintage drums and and you know, and so much stuff. So I, I knew your name well before we got to meet in person and, and, you know, but, but you were like a legend in my mind because you were the guy that could, could get him whatever he needed. It sounded like he, you know, and another, the other uh, blonde maple kit to have as the B kit for the yeah. 97 for the bridges to Babylon tour. And yeah. I remember seeing that kit up close the first time I, I saw them on that tour in, in 97 yeah. And I, I was blown away at, at, at its at its um, condition and, and how close it was to Charlie's actual kit. And he said, yeah, yeah Richard King down at, you know, he, down in, in Maryland got me this kit, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> wow, man, it's like perfect. <laughs> yeah, that so, came together really nicely. Yeah. So um, I think uh, what, what you and I talked about earlier about uh, today's discussion was we're uh, going to primarily try to focus on um, the drum sets that Charlie used from 1960 to 1978, which is when he got the maple kit, though, one that he still used up to the very last tour, the, the concert that right. he did. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, we've seen a lot of great stories about Charlie and his personality and what a great drummer was he was, and, and we all miss him terribly, but we haven't really seen a lot of uh, information about his drum sets, and that's kind of what we wanted to touch on today, uh, just to... Just as a different uh, uh, idea of what, looking at Charlie's stuff, you know, because he, he reused a lot of drums over the years. So. Yeah, and so, yeah, absolutely. Uh, we set up a little bit of a timeline here. And yeah, there's a, that's his first kit that he used uh, with Alexis Corner, which is a red sparkle sonar kit. And uh, as far as I know, that kit got traded in. So who knows? It might be bouncing around England somewhere. But he, yeah, apparently he didn't use that whole lot, a whole lot with the uh, Stones. He, 
there is one or two pictures of him with the stones, but you can't really see the kit. You can just kind of see like the floor tom, the edge of it in some of those pictures. But yeah, that's the, yeah. the, uh, the red sparkle kit. And uh, I wish to God that, was, that would surface and that we have some kind of documentation on it. But it, it's gone. We'll never know what happened to it, you know. So he yeah, used that. Yeah. And I yeah. used that on like uh, when they were just getting going like in 62 up till about 63. And then uh, roughly uh, according to this in May of 63, he went to Drum City in uh, London, which is the same place that... Um, that Ringo got his Black Oyster set right around the same time within a month of each other. Only Charlie chose to get the Sky Blue Pearl kit. Um, right. And he yep. used that all the way up through the late 60s, uh, right up until about 68 or something like that, maybe as late as 69. And by that time, he'd gotten a Gretsch drum set. But along the way, um, uh, in, this, in that era, early era, when he bought that uh, Ludwig kit, from Drum City, he also got um, a number of Zildjian symbols with it, a pair of hi-hats, a crash, and a ride. And he used those symbols forever. I mean, they they uh, they still have those symbols in his collection. And when you pull them out and look at them, they are just worn to death, man. I mean, they <laughs> put crap out of them. And uh, a few years ago, um, the Rolling Stones decided to put together, you know, uh, a traveling exposition, like a traveling museum of all their stage gear and clothing and guitars and uh, they, they brought the drum set out of mothballs that sky blue kit and i was got, uh, contacted by don mccauley to uh, find uh, some of the missing bits because over the years they had taken the front head off and they'd lost the t-rods and claws and they'd lost like parts of the stands and and so we put together like a, a care package to ship the london of all these goodies yeah and there's the kit as it sits today that was taken from the uh, exhibitionism uh, tour. And this is the uh, exhibition, I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, there's, a, there's a book that, a companion book that came out with that, but the kit's still in uh, the hands of, Rolling, of the Rolling Stones, well, Charlie's uh, estate basically. And all the hardware has been preserved. They have everything that came with it. When it originally came from the, uh, the store, it had the flat base Ludwig hi-hat, the two uh, uh, Ludwig cymbal stands. And, and I think it had the, uh, the Buck Rogers snare stand. And that uh, for a long time, that's what he used. But at some point in 64, I think it was, he used a drum set uh, at a concert that he was playing. I have a picture of it and um, I don't have it here in the file. And he played a Rogers, an English Rogers drum set. And on that Rogers drum set, uh, the English Rogers drum sets did not have American stands. So they would import stands. There was a, an American Rogers Swivomatic hi-hat stand on that kit. And basically, he just fell in love with that hi-hat. He used Roger Swivomatic hi-hats all the way to the very end, along with the Ludwig Speed King bass drum pedal. And that was his, uh, his pedal of choice, you know. So and the hi-hat goes back that far to the early, yeah, sort about, of mid-60s. About yeah. 64, yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I think it was because he had a chance to play that, that, that Rogers, that English Rogers kit that had all... It had a bunch of Rogers hardware with it. And that's the one thing that he really fell in love with was the hi-hat. And the Rogers Swivomatic hi-hats are terrific hi-hats. They play beautifully. And a lot of guys still use them today. You know, Buddy Rich loved them. You know, it's a yeah. great hi-hat. I just want to, and I, I want, I, this is so fantastic. This, thank yeah. you for doing this. And I just want to point out that, um, unfortunately, Don McCauley, who's, uh, Char who was Charlie's tech for the last 10 or so years, who's now out with Steve Jordan in the Rolling Stones, couldn't be here today. We... I was hoping that he could join us, but he's on tour and um, he's he's done a uh, a prior show with me. But uh, but anyway, I just want to point out that Don painstakingly restored these drums to their original beauty. If you can, yep. as Richard pointed out, you know this this is the kit today, and uh, I know it didn't. He he was sending me pictures while he was restoring these drums, you know, <laughs> five six years ago, and they he did a phenomenal job bringing these drums back to their beauty. They just look unbelievable. Yeah. Look at you that. know, that's, anyway. one of, that's one of the really cool things about Don is all the previous drum techs that worked for Charlie, none of them played drums, you know, or, or worked on drums or whatever, you know. You yeah. had Ian Stewart, who was a piano player. You had Chooch McGee, who was just a good roadie, a great roadie, but he didn't play drums. And then you had a guy named Mike Cormier, who actually was a drum tech who worked for a, for a Canadian drummer from the band called The Tragically Hip. Mm. Um, 
but when they got Don McCauley, Don is, is a professional drummer in his own right. And he's also a phenomenal woodworker and, and carpenter. He, he makes, and he's done some work to help restore uh, Charlie's current um, maple kit that he used up till he passed away. Cause that set was that bass drum and the floor tom and the right tom, they're literally falling apart, you know, from all the yeah. being outside on stages and, you know, Buenos Aires and then Europe, and they would play out in all kinds of weather. And those drums were really starting to, to kind of see the damage. And so the, uh, Ch Charlie was really, really fortunate to have a guy like Don step into the picture and take over and really know his stuff. So he was the per right person to be there when they were restoring these drums for the uh, museum. This is the companion book for exhibitionism. And it's got all kinds of great pictures of Charlie's drums, the way they look today, you know. So I have uh, book, yeah. one little story about the Sky Blue set. Um, when I uh, I would have uh, I would go to a lot of concerts uh, with uh, with Charlie during the '90s and '80s and whatnot, and um, I would always ask him about some of his old drums. And I, I asked him about the Sky Blue set, you know, and he had no idea where it was when I talked to him about it back in like I would about about 1997 or 1998. I was asking, you know, whatever happened to the uh, to the sky blue set and he says i oh, don't really know and then he, he <laughs> thought that it had been stripped that they had peeled the finish off or something like that because they were talking about it you know mm. and what it turned out is uh there was a gentleman that lived in uh, london that was the handler of all the drums for charlie watts uh and for ringo Starr. his previous job before he did that was he was the drum tech for keith moon a guy by the name of Bill Harrison. Bill Harrison, yeah. yeah. Bill Harrison had a, a, a really nice place where he stored all these drums for all these years. And, and that's where they found the, the Sky Blue pit kit. When they when Bill Harrison passed away, um, they just, you know, everybody came and got their drums. You know, Ringo got his drums out of storage. And uh, Charlie's, uh, well, I think either Don or Mike Cormier went over there and grabbed all that stuff and took it away and put it in, in the in nice flight cases and storage. So it was a real surprise uh, a few years ago when uh, when Don was doing all the restoration and they brought all this stuff in that they you know found over at Bill Harrison's place and there was the Sky Blue set it was completely original but missing everything and dirty and filthy and smoke stains and whatever you know and <laughs> they put it all back together you know <laughs> amazing well I, I have a similar story I'll quickly tell yeah. you that that I was obsessed with the black nitron that you know he had he had two. And there was the one which we'll show the one that you you sent a picture of, which was the 68 kit, uh, which is a round badge. And then in, in the early 70s, he had the stop sign badge kit that had the metal hoops on the bass drum. Yeah. And, and when I saw the movie, Ladies and Gentlemen, the Rolling Stones in 74, which was from the 72 tour, that was the kit that I was like obsessed with. And I, and I asked him about that drum kit once and I, I sort of like semi-jokingly said you know would you would you ever want to sell it <laughs> and he he kind of scratched his head he said i said do you still have that kit and he said i i probably have it somewhere i don't know he he did he didn't know for sure but he said i i i think it's somewhere maybe maybe it's in store <laughs> somewhere but he but he but he was he sort of dismissed it as like you know i, I why would you want that kit you know like why, why would you want that he said that i said well because it's you know I, it's a black early yeah. 70s Gretsch kit you played it on all those tours and you know wow. but, he was, but he was so enamored of his his maple kit you know he's like well the ones I have now are really they're better you know they're they're better you know because they're older and uh, anyway just to um I, I do want to just there's a couple questions which I'll answer really quickly um mm -hmm. Anthony Cassina is asking if the Ludwig kit was a 22 13 16 and the answer was yes uh yep they were all of his kits except the most the the maple kit right now were 22 13 16 which right. right the maple kit today has a is a 12 inch tom and a 16 and a 22. um ron gerber is asking where are they on display and it was on display in new york they had it in la they had it in london um australia, know, australia yeah so it's it a traveling yeah it's all uh, put it's, away yeah. It's all put away now. Yeah, it's no longer on display. I saw it five years ago in New York. Wow. Um, yeah, it was pretty amazing. And and our yard is is mentioning that Bill was also with the faces too. Bill Harrison was also yes. uh, Kenny Jones tech as well. So um, so and there's Dave Maddox, Sonar, right. Sonar set from Drum City. I'll be bound. <laughs> 
So I'm sorry, Rich. I just wanted to just share a couple of these comments with you. And, and no, um, this is fantastic. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think that that's something I, I think you might have mentioned earlier. We're not trying to be authorities about this stuff. We're not know-it-alls. We just want this to be an open discussion and really, really invite people to, invite, to, to send questions. And, and if they have any pictures or insights to some of these stories and can add to them, that'd be great, you know, because, yeah, yeah. you know, we're not real experts on this stuff. You know, we, we weren't there in the 60s when this stuff was happening, you know. Yeah, there's the black kit. <laughs> that's yeah. on Brian. Last uh, last televised appearance with the Stones in 1960, early 69, I think it was that, or late 68, I can't remember. That brand new black nitron kit there, isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful, yeah. Uh, yep. And uh, I bet they sound amazing. God, you know, it's funny is uh, uh, another picture I sent you has a picture of them playing at Hyde Park just a few months later when after Brian had passed away and Mick Taylor was playing in the band, and uh, he's playing the the sky blue nine by thirteen tom tom with the black nitron bass drum and floor tom uh so it's a real mix you know yeah uh, yep it's it's kind of odd that he did that and you'll see that on the sessions for um for uh, can't always no, no, i'm sorry sympathy for the devil there's a whole movie that was made for sympathy for the devil and in those sessions you'll see that same kit the black nitron bass drum and the floor tom and uh, the sky blue pearl ludwig tom tom go figure you know yeah, and and the Ludwig snare as well. The, you can see, mm -hmm. I, I've I've seen this picture as well, where you can see it's this his four hundred. And and my best guess, Richard, and 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 you you might know better is this. You, you, like you're right. This was Hyde Park, July of nineteen sixty nine, and they were in the studio at that time recording the Let It Bleed album. Right. And and from those sessions came Honky Tonk Woman, of course. Yeah. And when people talk about you know what was he playing, what was the snare drum, what was he using on that on that song and on that record and my my knowing charlie and and his um i mean he did switch things from time to time but when he when he found something he liked he tended to stick with it you know yeah, um, yeah. i would guess that this is what he used for the let it bleed sessions and probably yeah. honky tonk woman this, this yeah setup. same drum set from the sympathy for the devil as well yeah yep yep that's uh, the, you brought up a really good point. There's actually two Ludwig Chrome snare drums. There's a Superphonic 400 and there's a Super Sensitive. Early on, if you look at the pictures of the Sky Blue kit, it's got a Superphonic 400, which has just got the regular P85 on it. Uh, yeah. In this picture, uh, it's kind of hard to see, but around that, that time when he was playing Hyde Park and using the Black Nitron kit, he kind of switched between the Gretsch Chrome over Brass snare drum and a yeah. Super Sensitive. He had a Super Sensitive from the mid 60s. Oh, okay. uh, you can still see the superphonic from this kit is in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. If you go in there, there's a small, actually, it's not a small, so pretty good size exhibition that's on permanent loan to the, uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And in there is a picture, uh, not a picture, but the actual snare drum of Charlie's in the superphonic. Um, the picture that you see from the, the museum, uh, the Traveling Roadshow, if you look at the Sky Blue kit in that picture, it's a super sensitive in that picture. So okay, you had two drums. I, so I, I didn't realize I, that. Yeah, I mean, I just found that out just doing this research. I was like, oh, yeah, forgot about that. Fantastic. So, well, uh, you, you know what's great about this picture? I just have to point out a couple of things, three things that I think are fantastic. Ian Stewart in the background behind Charlie, you can see him yep. kind of in between the amps. Charlie's floor tom is upside down. If you look at where the floor yep. tom legs are, they're up high. <laughs> so, <laughs> Stu must have put his drums together for him and just, you know, put them together that way and mick taylor's guitar stand <laughs> which is his <laughs> his high watt amp <laughs> yeah that just kind of like that's like a, a guitar that's probably worth two hundred fifty thousand dollars today <laughs> getting up those yeah. high, you know what i mean <laughs> it's classic it's such a classic yeah. i remember reading a, a quote from mick taylor it was the first live concert he played with the band having just joined them you know a week before and he and they, if you have ever heard the recording of that concert, it's it's pretty awful. I mean, they just yeah. did not have a good day. And he he was yeah. like, it's they're worse than a garage band. But right. <laughs> but it was, you know, a few months later on the road, they recorded Get Your Yeah Yeahs out and it was magic. I mean, it was just, yeah. you know, just pure magic. But well, anyway. the PA systems back then were so horrible, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I've exactly. read a lot. A lot of stories about the PA systems that were used back then. I'm reading a book by a guy named Bill Hanley who did sound for Woodstock, and he went to Hyde Park 
to help out with the system there because they were using those WEM speakers, which you'll see in just about all the pictures of the stones from Hyde Park. And, uh, and the sound was horrible. He said you could, it was just, it was all distorted and, and, and just awful, you know, compared to nowadays the systems are state of the art, you know. I do have an Ian Stewart story, actually. Um, I never met Ian Stewart because when I met the guys, the lads in 1989, Ian Stewart was long gone, but they all talked about him highly. But a few years after I met the, the, the Stones and, and Chooch and all them, one of the truck drivers uh, came up to me. His, his name was Russ. And he, uh, when he would finish unloading all the trucks and they parked and everything, he would help out around the stage with the Stones. He'd been with them for a long, long time. And he was not like an official roadie. You won't see his name anywhere. But he, he'd been around for a long time. And one of the stories that he told me, he said that, uh, you know, Ian Stewart handled all the equipment. And they would show up very early for the show. And they would, you know, bring all the equipment up on stage and pull them out of the cases and stuff. And Ian Stewart would literally just kind of throw Charlie's drums up and set them up as quick as he could because all he wanted to do was get out and play golf. And Charlie, there's lots of pictures of Charlie uh, while they're playing, trying to adjust the hi-hat or moving stands around because they were never, and you can see that floor tom, how it was upside down. That was probably yeah. Ian Stewart just kind of slapping it up there. I got to go, boys. I'm going to play golf, you know? <laughs> I, I've heard the same story. Chooch told me a story about, about uh, Ian, yeah, throwing the stuff up there and and uh, yeah, and not taking a lot of <laughs> tender loving care with no. with, with the equipment. <laughs> Just getting it up there any old way, you know, it's hilarious. Yeah. But I guess when you had his kind of seniority, you know, and his sort of history with the band, he just he probably you know he didn't really answer to anybody, you know, he just it's true. Um, there's, there's a picture I've, I've seen it of of charlie on his black set from the 72 tour and it's it's the 13 inch tom is set up so that the two internal tone controls are facing out to the audience oh yeah which, which means the badge was in facing so you know i mean it's like it's us being yeah. drummers would never do that we'd always want you know you always want it to look right you want the badge facing out and so yeah. but when i when i heard that story about Stu, I, I thought, well, that had to be, you know, he just put the Tom Tom on the snare stand and Charlie would, probably didn't even notice it. Yeah. <laughs> but Charlie would show up to sound check and then he'd have to move things around. And then during the gig, you'll see pictures of him moving the hi hat over the, the, the Tom Tom was slipping <laughs> and up properly. You know, it just, uh, Ian, you're right. Ian Stewart had nobody paid attention to, uh, would, would go against him, let's put it that way. He yeah, could do whatever yeah. he wanted. He had complete authority over the over the equipment. They would completely defer to him. If he said, we're going to do it this way, that's just the way they did it, you know? <laughs> yeah. Glad you um, put this picture up. Yeah, I, I'm going to just answer Anthony's question real quick, and then I'd love for you to talk about his, his Black Diamond Pearl kit. But um, Anthony, to answer your question, do we know if Charlie ever talked about why he changed the 13 to a 12? And I think Richard would back me up. The answer to that is simply, that's the tom tom that came with that set yep and and that was that he loved yep. that drum set yeah when he when he rented it for a session for ronnie wood ronnie wood album and uh you know that was it there's a whole lot of story behind that maple kit um we have one more drum set between the black nitron kit and the maple kit to talk about and that's the black diamond pearl kit which is uh, used was used quite extensively. They had a number of world tours in the in the early to mid seventies, you know. And that black diamond pearl kit you'll see used quite a bit. This picture is really interesting because it's the first picture where you start to see them use coloring colored tape to kind of mark where the stands go, how far up they go up, and how how to set them up. And you can kind of make it out in the picture. There's yellow and there's blue and there's red tape. It's just electrical tape they would use to mark the stands, so there was some kind of consistency, you know. And I don't yeah, know if that's yeah. Ian Stewart or maybe one of the lads that they, you know, there's a bunch of boys that did uh, the help set up and move equipment. And maybe one of the guys had the brains and said, hey, why don't we put some tape to help mark these, you know? And uh, that, that, that picture is one of the very first pictures where you see colored tape being used. And from that point on, you'll see a lot of that throughout their shows. You don't, you don't see much of that now with Don because he's got it. He has a different way of marking stuff. You, you don't see a lot of colored tape on the, on the last uh, tours that Charlie did there, they were all gone with that because uh, Don had set up a much better way of marking it. And the, the same with the carpet, the carpet was all marked uh, tape on the carpet with like little X's where that stands would go. So they would be yeah. more consistent. And Chooch carried on with them. When I met him, he was still doing that. He would, Chooch carried a tape measure and you'd see him going measuring. He knew all the statistics between 
where the tom tom was, how high it was, how far it was over, and he would me- he would constantly measure them with a tape measure, and that uh, that way he could dial in everything exactly the way Charlie wanted it and be consistent so that so Charlie could show up for sound check or for the drunk or for the show and just sit down and play and not have to worry about moving stuff around. And you'll see less of that in the future. In the after Chooch came in, you'll see a lot less of that moving. Charlie having to move the drums and do anything because they were already done by then, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he took it to to another level, and I and, and I, I'm glad you pointed out this kit, the significance, because I, for a long time, I didn't realize the significance of this drum set until, like yourself, I really kind of dug deep into it and realized that, you know, even though um, in 1972 we saw him playing the Black Nitron kit, right, um, he had recorded Exile on Main Street a year earlier with this drum set, yeah, um, so. This is to me. This is like the holy grail of drum sets. It's yeah. you know on Sticky Fingers. It's on Exile on Main Street. It's on Get Your Yeah Yeahs Out. It's it's a yeah. Some of the greatest recordings that the that the Stones ever did was that, those albums, and that yeah. those drums are all over them. And I believe yeah. on that drum set, he's again. I've seen him sitting up with uh, the Chrome Gretsch snare drum and Chrome uh, Super Sensitive on this kit. You know, I've seen yes. both. Which brings us to the symbols. Okay, yeah. All yeah. right, let's... Yeah. Now, okay. it, uh, he constantly used Zildjian's uh, early on in the 60s when he got that super classic kit, he got Zildjian's with it. And all through the 60s and into the 70s, he was using them. At some point, um, he uh, got a pasty endorsement. I'm not really sure exactly when that happened. It's, it's not very clear, but there's a picture from the pasty um, endorsement uh, that, that shows Charlie endorsing them and it has all his sizes and stuff. And uh, you rarely see pictures where you can clearly see pasty uh, logos on their symbols. But when I met him in 1989, he only had one pasty symbol left, and that was the 16-inch Thin Crash, which was, if you looked at that last picture of the uh, Black Diamond Pearl kit, you can see the symbols are over to his right by the floor toms, and there's no crash in front of the snare drum or the ride tom. And for a while, you see that, that he sets up like that, just a ride and a crash. And that little 16 is in that picture. It's a Formula 602. And uh, you can hear that very clearly on, on that song, Brown Sugar. When he hits that one symbol, it's so predominant. That's that 16-inch Formula 602, which he used forever. He was still using it when I met him in 89. It was still on the drum set, but it was old. And I was like, man, I can't believe he's gotten this much mileage out of it because those symbols are very prone to cracking. They're the most amazing crash symbols, but they do crack very easy. So at some point, uh, he was, yeah, there it is. You can yep, see the, the small crash symbol. It's a 16 inch over to the, to the right there. And uh, he did get a, a, a limited pasty endorsement. And I don't know if those, the ride or the, or the hi hats in that picture are pasties. We'd have to, you know, we'd have to take them apart and look at them somehow, but I, we don't have the facility to do that, you know? Right. And, uh, and he did that for just a very short while. And I think um, by the time, he broke all the symbols bit by bit. I think the only one left was that 16 inch trash. So uh, by the time he finished uh, with, uh, with that, using that drum set and they, they, they finished that last tour that they were supporting for that, which is uh, only rock and roll. Was it uh, that, uh, that album? What's the name of that? Heartbreaker, only rock and roll. Anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah. When they finished that tour, that was around the mid seventies. Uh, they had a little bit of a break, then they came back in and they, they recorded, they were preparing to do Some Girls. And that's when I think they did, uh, rock, they were going to do an album, he was going to do an album with Ronnie Wood. And the story is that they needed, uh, they, they had, they wanted to rent a drum set from SIR for Ronnie's album. And SIR, SIR which is Studio Instrument Repairs and re- or Rehearsal or whatever, uh, Rentals, I mean, I'm sorry, Studio in- Instrument re- Rentals, was a facility that uh, provided drums for all the different artists, you know, and they didn't have what he wanted in a Gretsch kit. He wanted a round badge Gretsch kit, and they didn't have a round badge. Uh, and so apparently one of the young men that worked at the SIR, one of the roadies, had this Gretsch maple kit. And um, and they said, bring it on over, you know, and they brought it over and uh, and because he had to have that Gretsch kit. He didn't want to play Ludwig. He didn't want to play anything else. He wanted that Gretsch kit. And, uh, and he, he fell in love with it, you know, and he ended up offering the guy, he paid like a crazy amount of money, like $800 or something like that for it, you know? And to think <laughs> of all the mileage that he's gotten out of that kit since then, you know? Um, know. 
And the other thing about that kit, um, at the same time, SIR had a six and a half by 14 blue and olive badge Ludwig super sensitive and they, they, uh, that he was using at the rental at that time. And Charlie, as you well know, once he got used to playing something uh, and he liked it, he didn't want to change. So he took that chrome uh, uh, snare drum, this the Ludwig super sensitive, and you'll see that from that point on for like the, almost the next 20 years, he used that chrome super sensitive, real big, deep one. And that's in the picture in, the, in, the, in one of these uh, books, the uh, exhibitionism. Yep. And, uh, and he used it. Oh, also, that set came with black dot heads. When he got it, it had those black dot Remo heads. And everybody was like, you know, I can't believe he's got these black dot heads. There's a six and a half right there. Yeah. 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 And uh, so he got the, the, the black dot heads on that drum set. And again, Charlie got used to playing with that drum set with those black dot heads on it. And that's the way it stayed from that point on. When I met him in 89, I wouldn't be surprised if they were the same exact drum heads that were on that set when he bought them. He, he just did not like to change drum sets or drum heads. You know what I mean? That's why it was rare that he would break them. They would just, he would wear the crap out of them, but he would he rarely broke them, you know? And yeah. you can't really see in that picture, but I'll bet dollars and donuts. It's a black dot. Oh, and this is the other thing. The bass drum batter head on that drum set came with a clear Evans hydraulic, an early one with a white plastic ring on it. Right. And I don't know <laughs> if you can actually see it in that picture, but when I met him, it still had one of those clear plastic uh, Evans hydraulic heads on it. And so when we built the reproduction kit for the B stage, I had to go out and find a vintage brand new Evans hydraulic clear head with the white <laughs> plastic ring. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh my. I, I, I saw that kit. I, I didn't meet Charlie in 89, but I did yeah. see that kit up close yeah. when they played here in Boston at, and at Gillette stadium or the old, whatever it was called back then, Foxborough Stadium. And, and I did sit behind his drums and I did notice the Evans um, vintage, you know, um, hydraulic head with the ceramic hoop, as you talked about. And I did the, the 16 inch crash. I had always wondered what it was because for years I assumed it was a Zildjian, a yeah. Zildjian, you know, thin, really thin old A. Yeah, real bright. Sound. Yeah, real bright. And sure enough, I looked at it, and as soon as I saw it up close, I could tell by the by the cup, by the bell, that it was it was diff very different. It had a very flat profile, and sure enough, it said it said Peisty Arbiter six o two Custom Arbiter or something six o two. Yeah. And I went, holy shit! It's it's a Peisty, you know, and <laughs> and the and the flat ride and all the you you know the UFIP chinas and so yeah, that was an eye opening moment for me too to to see those yeah. all that stuff up close, you know. Um, but this is tremendous history and background. And, and, uh, my, my pal, Todd Little, who's quite right. a, uh, Charlie Watts historian. I'm sure, you know, Todd mm -hmm. is just commenting that Charlie used a 20 inch, uh, Peisty giant beat on the 72 tour and a 2002 right. ride on the 75 tour, probably 78 and 81. And, and he and I go back and forth about this all the time on, on, um, mm -hmm. you know, like, as you said, he was, he was using, um, he told me that he he mixed he played he always had some zildjians mixed in with what he used yeah but for a long time you know i could not get him to talk about what he and i and i used to, you know used to say to him charlie it's okay if you played peisty <laughs> i i don't mind you know i said i i'm not i'm not asking you but you know <laughs> taking off my you know my zildjian hat you know when i worked for zildjian i'd be like i just want to know from a from a fan you know from a drummer yeah. standpoint what those symbols were. And he'd say, Oh, I don't remember. I, I there might've been some Pisces. I asked him once about the giant beats because I started to zero in on the sound. And I said, you know, it sounds like it's, the, you know, the giant beat that you're using. And he's like, yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. And then I mentioned six Oh twos. And he said, I remember those, you know, he did remember uh -huh. those and he was still using that um, still using the 16, you know, that he had. And, and he told me he bought that symbol in around 1968 that 16 inch yeah it's an old one yeah yeah and it cracked in 2007 at the end of that of that tour um it finally went and i saw him the next year and he was he was lamenting it he said uh, you know i it finally went on me you know i've had that i had it 40 years and it and i said yeah. the same thing you said i said i said man i can't believe you you know and he hit that thing too i mean he did not yeah. he didn't he didn't pamper it you know yeah, he didn't mince words with those things.
no, he didn't. I said, I can't believe you got that much life out of it, you know, but yeah. Um, well, but, that, uh, another th- symbol uh, note as well was when he got those pasties, the endorsement in that pile was a China type symbol. And I think that's the first time that he starts using a China symbol as a crash because there are pictures of him with that China, the pasty 2002 black letter uh, ch- uh, China symbol. And, uh, and at some point he had it over by the ride, Tom, and he started using it. And uh, I'm not sure why or when he switched over to the UFIP 18 inch Chinas. I'm not sure the reasoning for that. I, I think part of it is because as you well know, uh, he found that him and Chooch went to a shop in Paris and found that 18 inch flat ride, mm-hmm. which is probably uh, a, the biggest part of his story is how he, everything you've seen Charlie do since 1976 has had that 18 inch flat ride in it. Everything, whether it was the jazz band, whether it was Stones, everything has this flat ride on it, everything. And we've never been able to find another one all these years for the last 35 years, we've had everybody around the world trying to find this ride. It's not a regular UFIP. It's a, it's a different line of UFIPs. And uh, we have never been able to find another one. And most of the time when you find ride symbols from Pasty or Zildjian or Sabian, they're somewhat tapered. This symbol is almost perfectly flat. It's, it's the most unusual symbol and it has a really delicate glassy ride sound to it. And Charlie just absolutely loved that symbol forever. And he talked about it in many, many interviews. He would just say, I don't know why, but that symbol just is the most beautiful, lovely. He would use the word lovely a lot. It's the most lovely ride he'd ever played in his life. And he cherished that thing, you know, and that yeah, he used yeah. it all the way to the very end. And that's a big part of his sound was this, this flat ride. Now behind it, you can see another 18 inch u China. Right. Uh, he had a number of those, and one of those is, was given to uh, Don McCauley had one uh, that he gave to Steve Jordan for the current tour. And so, so if you look at pictures of Steve Jordan, he's got one of those identical uh, China types that's using over on the right hand side of his drum set by the floor toms. And uh, that, that ride symbol is just everything. So I think out of the love and the, the re- respect that he had for this ride symbol, he ended up switching over the China symbol to the uh, to the UFIT line, you know. And yeah, that could well be. Yeah. I, I, I never knew the history. I just, I I remember seeing, um, in 78, the first time I saw him using the China on the, some girls tour, it was a UFIP. So, um, but Todd, I'll, I'll I'll mention Todd a little again. Todd has pointed out that I think it's, I think it was Todd that had pointed out in in some other conversations that, um, that he's, he was seen using a Peisty, uh, China, maybe mm-hmm. a 602 or something. And that maybe it was because he, and, and you know this probably better than anybody because you were supplying these UFIP symbols to him. Maybe he just couldn't get them at the time and he yeah. went to another source, you know, for a China. Yeah. I, yeah. It's, yeah, well, it's, it's a big Yeah, there's, there's a lot to that because, uh, uh, you know, he was not one for endorsements. He just didn't really like endorsements. Whenever I would talk to Chooch about an endorsement, Chooch, why don't we get an endorsement for this or that? Chooch would be like, nah, we don't need that stuff. We don't need, we don't want endorsements. And I was like, all right, you know. So when I first met Charlie in 89, he was using the, the UFIPs. And uh, those UFIPs are very, very delicate symbols. You can see one back here. And there's a story behind this symbol. And uh, so what he, Chooch would call me up like every other month. Rich, can you get me another UFIP China? I'm like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I couldn't believe this. So I, I would call this guy in New York City by the name of Paul Real. And he was the distributor for UFIP on the East Coast, or maybe in the entire United States, I don't remember. He used to see his advertisement in the back of Modern Trump, a little tiny little blip in the very back. So I called him up one day and I said, hey, you know, we need China for, you know, for, for Charlie and this and that. And he was your typical, I, I don't, it sounded like a New York kind of guy, you know, all right, we can get you one, you know. And we would import them one at a time from to Italy, from UFIP, ship them directly to me. And by the time we pay duty and shipping and stuff like that, that symbol costs like five hundred dollars, man. Oh. And I would go to Chucho and said, "I can't believe you guys are spending so much money on the symbol. You can get them for free." So uh, <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And he would break them. And you know, Charlie, he just loved hitting that eighteen-inch China man. He just sock it, you know. And it was, oh, he loved playing that thing. So in nineteen ninety-four, um, UFIP was uh, handed over to distri- distribution 
worldwide to a new company uh, by the name of a German company. Uh, I forgot the name of it, but a guy named Alec Ledgerwood. And he was associated with DW and they were going to distribute DW in, in Europe. And they were going to, in, in flip side of that, distribute UFIP through DW. Uh, and uh, that was the big deal. So I, I had just done some business with him. So I called him up and I said, is there any way we can get like a, a limited endorsement for Charlie Watts? And, and, and he was like, yeah, no problem, you know. So uh, Chooch uh, gave me an order of symbols. We got a, a couple of flat rides to see if we could find a replacement for the flat ride. And we got like 60 of these China symbols. <laughs> and they arrived in, uh, in the summer of 1994 uh, uh, at the uh, JF, uh, I'm sorry, RFK Stadium in, in Washington, D.C., or where, near where I live here. And they were rehearsing for a whole week. And uh, this, this crate of symbols shows up. And, and Chooch is like, hey, Rich, the symbols are right. So we start pulling them all out. And Charlie starts going through, banging all of them. And out of all those symbols, he kept like, like two or three, just a couple of them. Left it. All mm -hmm. the other ones, he was like, nah, I don't want them. But as part of the, because I had um, facilitated the deal with Charlie for these uh, symbols and with Chooch, I mean, they gave, me, uh, they gave me this one here and Charlie signed it for me. And, uh, and, uh, I've, I've had it ever since. I had it framed and, and hung up in my display. And this symbol here is signed Charlie Boy 1994 when it was done at RK. But at the same time, they gave me another one. And this is the 18 inch China. This one has rivets in it. And uh, I use it every once in a great big while. But this wow. is one of those original symbols from the 1994 uh, stash. I still keep this one. And it's just a lovely sounding symbol. And from that point on, uh, Charlie got his symbols from UFIP directly and they never had to pay for them. And to the, the very end, uh, Charlie was getting them shipped to, I guess, to Don or, or whoever, and they would handle all that stuff. And, and they would send them other stuff from time to time, so ride symbols, crash symbols, uh, hi-hats, just to try out. But of course, you know, Charlie, once he got set. So um, that's the UFIP side of the story. He still played Zildjian. So when I met him in 89, he had a pair of old, uh, new beat hi hats, 14 inch on the hi hats, yep. and he had uh, the flat ride, the china, the 602, and at that time that was the extent of symbol setup. Um, when he, um, about two years later after I met him, he did like a jazz tour. He brought out this gigantic like 20 or 22 inch Zildjian swish ride symbol with the rivets in it, just this huge thing, and you'd hit it and it would just go yep. for yep. hours, man. <laughs> And that's what he used. So uh, he, he continued to use that for all those years, you know. Um, and so that, do we have any more questions before I go any further? Um, no, I'm just, Gary Marshall, my friend in the UK, Gary Marshall, great yeah. guy, great drummer, uh, mentioned, he asked, didn't T, T Bruce Wittett, Bruce Wittett or Paul Francis find another flat ride? And I can answer that question. Um, so in 2012, when, when Don took over as Charlie's Tech and they were gearing up for the 50 and counting tour, I was contacted by Pierre, um, who had taken over as, as um, you know, the backline chief and, and Chooch went after Chooch passed away. And uh, Pierre uh, de Beauport and told me that, you know, Don McCauley is gonna be coming in as the tech. And basically we're, we're looking, we need to get another ride as a backup for Charlie, another flat ride. And we had taken a stab before at trying to make something for him. I was still with Zildjian, although I was kind of on my way out at that point. Um, but the long story short is I happened to be in Montreal at, a, at, at the drum festival, Montreal Drum Fest that weekend oh, yeah. when, when Pierre called me. And uh, I bumped into T. Bruce Wittet, or as I call him, Bruce Wittet, at the show. <laughs> and, and Bruce said, I have one of those symbols. Oh, I forget wow. how, we even, how it even came up in conversation, but Bruce said to me, I'll... I'll he had met Charlie, had interviewed him for, for Modern Drummer Magazine in, in the year 2000. And he said, I don't know if Charlie will remember me. I think he will, but I'll, I'll, um, I'll send it to you if you can get it, pass it on to Charlie. So he did. And, uh, and, and I, I sent it along to Don, and I believe he still has it as a backup. And it's really close. And I think I might even have a picture of it somewhere. Oh, wow. um, let me see if I do, but I'll, I'll keep looking while we're talking. But um, okay. Yeah, the best we could we could determine to your point is it was made by Italian made. Um, we think by UFIP or some subsidiary of UFIP, some yes. offshoot company there. 
and it's and it's uh, it says golden bell on it i yes. believe somewhere yeah. scripted yeah. um made in italy but but doesn't have like a brand name of like tosco or ufip or any of the sort of known italian names that we know so yeah. it's a it's definitely a mystery um, well that's the, the interesting about ufip ufip is it's not just one company ufip is union fabricante it's a group of symbol makers and they're right. different that were involved in that and those uh, they had different offshoots of that and the different companies would use rubber stamp the UFIP to, to indicate that they were part of that union of fabricants or fabricators of symbols and so That's they right. came yep. from all over the place they're, they're all different you know yeah here's um all right let me see I think I do have yeah this is all right hang with me folks I just found something I think <laughs> So this, oh, oh. this is, this was, I took this photo in my office back in 2012 yeah. when I was still there and you can see it. Um, yeah. Pro custom or pro cushion. Sorry. I see it. Yeah. Yeah. And, but it seems to be the same family as Charlie's flat. Yeah. Yeah. Was it, is, is that symbol, you know, how Charlie's is really, really flat. It's almost like a perfectly flat symbol. It has a little bit of a dish to it, but like yeah. I said, the Dojans and pasties and, and other brands have a much more pronounced uh, taper to them. And, and Charlie's was almost perfectly flat, except for just a little bit in the middle, you know, you can barely see it. Yeah. Was I don't know if this one was quite that flat. That's a really good yeah. question. Uh -huh. um, and not only that, but I think that the Charlie symbol was a cheaper line. It was a, it was more like the uh, like a, a B8 uh, or what, something like that, like the Sabian uh, or Zildjian has like the, the what they call the sheet symbols. It was something That's more right. akin to that. It was not a, a heavily hammered symbol or lay symbol. It was very kind of cheapish. You know what I mean? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, was, it was the B8 uh, alloy, which is the typically the lesser expensive of the two, though, you know, yeah. Peisty makes many high you know professionals high-end professional yeah. symbols with the b8 alloy but yeah. but it tends to be um considered more of the sort of intermediate level stuff and you know they're they're more yeah. or less kind of stamped out but um but it's a it's a great uh sounding symbol for sure yeah. I mean, it's a it's a unique little you know yeah i have one last thing to say about the ufips when they were uh, practicing in jfk for a, uh, rfk i'm sorry in washington for a week uh, at one point, Chooch calls me up one night and I would go there and hang out every day at the stadium because they let me. What the heck, you know? And sure, so one yeah. day, Chooch calls me up and he says, Charlie's got a crack in his, in his China. He's freaking out because he really <laughs> loves it. And, and he would use different ones. Some of them were that earth tone finish, which is kind of like that raw, almost like a pasty rude finish, yeah. that kind of real nasty looking earth. They call them earth tones. It, at that, that particular junction, the China symbol he had was an earth tone uh, China. Uh, they're made from the same metal it just has a different finish on it different sound and it had a chunk it was starting to get like a like a u-shaped chunk in it and i have a friend here in annapolis uh maryland who had a machine shop and he was really good a machinist and so he i took it to him and he cut it out it cut like a little u-shaped thing out and then tapered it so it was there were no sharp edges and we brought it back to charlie and he was all oh, right you know and like two or three days later it was broken again <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, there, there we were with all those symbols, you know, and he just, he just so picky about them. You know, he was really, like I said, when he landed on something that he liked, he did not want to change it, you know? Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. I was going to uh, say, Richard, thing, oh, go ahead. Please continue. Yep. No, no, I, don't want to yeah. I was just going to say that he, he said the same thing because, you know, in my time at Zildjian, I of course was trying to, you know, um, have him try some of the different yeah. Chinas that Zildjian made and, and he could never land the closest he ever got to, to even remotely liking something was a 17 inch K, which was a little <laughs> smaller than what he was used to, but because they were, they tended yeah. to be thinner. Um, yeah. I think I even, one of the, the, chi the Oriental China symbols once, you know, he was sort of like, eh. and I, and I, and I totally knew what he meant. You know, it wasn't the same. And he'd say, he, and he would, he would, I always felt like he was trying to spare my feelings because he'd say, well, you know, I have to go through, and you've said this too, I have to go through a bunch to find the ones that I like, you know, it's not like every yeah. single one is perfect. Yeah. So he was trying to like, say to me, don't feel bad. I, it's not just you, you know, I, I have to, I'm very particular. And, and as you pointed out, and then he would say, and you know, they, the ones that I really like are thin and they, 
which is they have the best sound, but they don't last long. Yeah. They go fast. And and what I was trying to say is, well, if you know, if you could land on one that you liked that we make, I could probably supply you with a pretty consistent batch, knowing what the weights are. Oh, yeah. you know, but but we really never got to that point because he he wasn't interested and I wasn't going to push it, you know, but, but I was just going to, one last thing I was going to mention, Todd Little, our resident expert has said that um, Don told me a few, I guess this is what Todd's saying that he, Don figured out a few years ago that it is a Tosco, the 18 that he, I guess under the lights, they did see, uh, which is, I didn't realize this and maybe, maybe I didn't, uh -huh. I forgot it, but they did see the ghost of a Tosco stamp. Uh -huh. right, so that makes sense. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So this is great. This is just what you had said you hoped would happen which is it would open this discussion of people yeah. um you know sharing the info that they that they know and have so yeah um, but please yeah you you were going to say you were going to mention another point about the um well i interrupted I, you i think we talked about the ufips and the zildjians um there's there's more to talk about but i think what we wanted to try to do is uh, to do this discussion basically big uh honing in on 1960 to about 1978 ish 78-ish. And then the, if, if there's enough desire and, you know, to, uh, to make a second video follow up on this, we'll do more about the, uh, about more of the, the snare drums that he used after 1989 when I met him, because there's a whole lot of there about the snare drums and then also about all the drums that I built for him and put together for him with the help of a lot of people. And that's like a whole nother video in itself. That, so the last thing, I would like to bring up is just a little bit more about the hardware that he used. Sure. Yep. If you I was look just showing that time. Yeah. Yep. Let me, okay. let me grab those. Yep. There's a picture of Charlie playing the uh, maple kit in 1978 or 79 or something like that. And you can clearly see he's using the memory lock symbol stands, the Rogers memory lock symbol stands. Cause yes. up to that point, been using all those old cymbal stands that he'd left over from the sixties. He had a, a kind of a mishmash of flat base Ludwig's, Premier, Gretsch, and here you'll you'll see the the Rogers memory lock symbol stands came into play, and he used those right up till somewhere seventy eight through about um, the mid eighties. When I met him, he had switched over to the Gretsch, what they call Techware symbol stands, which he used all the way to the very end, yeah. and that yeah. was a whole another nightmare because you know Gretsch stopped making them a long time ago. And Charlie was very insistent that he wanted Gretsch, those Gretsch cymbal stands on his Gretsch drum set, besides the Rogers hi hat, you know. So my lot, my uh, my job for the from the time I met him in '89 till most recently was to find uh, those Gretsch. There you go, the Techware cymbal stands that was taken on the very last tour in 2019. That's yeah. those are the stands there, and then you can see the hi hat stand. Now, uh, one thing I'll have to add about the hi-hat stands is he was still using Rogers all the way to the end. But when he got that set of uh, memory lock cymbal stands, he also got a memory lock hi-hat stand. Uh, and it was th the new version of the uh, Rogers uh, memory lock uh, Swivomatic hi-hat stand. But the, this has the memory lock collar on it. And it has the black plastic uh, coupling here, which is different from the old ones. And so this coupler made it so it would never slip and they love that stones love that and they ended up buying a ton of these hi-hats from from everybody from dave from my friend dave drew at al drew's music in woonsocket rhode island they bought like i don't know 15 of them uh and then over the years they bought a number of them from other people including myself so they must have been lousy with these things but uh, <laughs> i think years. don don told me i i found a really nice one on ebay a couple of years ago like beautiful yeah. like and and, and you know, for not cheap money. And I, and I, I sent the link to Don. I said, check this out. It's, and he, he got back to me and he said, uh, thanks buddy. You know, we're all set. We have about 25 or something. Right. Like now. Like, we're, <laughs> we're good. The damn things. Well, <laughs> yeah. that was the crazy thing, you know, uh, back in 2019, when they were doing an, another world tour, uh, Don contacted me and he needed some other stands and hardware, but he needed a, one of these guys. And so I had one that I'd restored. And if you look at the picture that you had just put up, and you probably can't see it there, but you can see one of my yellow stickers. I put a, when I finished restoring these, I put my own yellow Roger sticker on it. And in one of those pictures, you can actually see that hi-hat with that sticker on it. And he used that to the very end, you know, those, uh, those hi-hat stands. It, they're yeah. terrific hi-hat stands. They're very light. And again, Charlie could have had anything he wanted, gold plated. And they, he just didn't, he wanted what he liked. And that was it. The last piece of hardware I'm going to bring up is yeah. the stool. Yeah. 
that drum throne that he used all this time, the one drum throne, I, all again, J John and myself and most drummers nowadays, we want the nicest, flushest, thickest, most luxurious drum thrones. We might not spend a lot of money on the drums, but we're going to buy the best darn drum throne we can get. And Charlie used that, that same old black uh, Ludwig drum throne from 1960 something all the way up to uh till most recently when he passed that was the same drum throne you know yeah yeah and uh, again in 2019 uh, don contacted me and says we need to get some backups for the drum throne i don't know how long it's more it's going to last because those legs are so rickety when you sit on it it's just you know all shaky any other drummer would have you know thrown away but charlie was very specific i gotta have that drum throne you know and so we made three copies of that and uh, they had to be hand fabricated because the older drum thrones had a, a two piece top on them. They were the, about a year later, they went to a one piece top, which is a thinner, but the two piece top is, is thicker and more uh, substantial and, and more solid. And if you look at Charlie's drum throne, I meant to send a picture to you, uh, to John. It's all got black tape on it and uh, it's all screwed back together. And he just would <laughs> not change that, you know, and he, I'm gonna... that, they made three more to match it, you know. I've, this isn't the best picture of it, but I've got a photo of it um, from the gearing up MD thing I did. Um, you can't really see it. Actually, you know what? I have a picture. I have a picture that Don took of me yeah. um, behind Charlie's drums. I'm going to find that in one second. Yeah. Um, but um, I was just going to say, just talking about the Rogers stuff, I, I sold Charlie or through Ian Stewart, that story when, when I met Ian Stewart in 1981, I sold him four of the Rogers straight cymbal stands. So yeah, he came in, I think he called ahead of time. I didn't know who he was on the yeah. phone, but when he came in, I certainly knew who he was. And he called us to see if I had them in stock. And I said, yes. And he was, you know, he, he came wow. back and yeah, there's, so there's the drum throne. It's probably not the best. Yeah. Um, yeah that's solo, the but, drum throne. Yeah. yeah. But it, you're right. It's, it's certainly not a, a heavy duty, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't get yeah. it, man. Really don't. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you can see the Rogers memory lock hi hat stand in there, the Swivomatic, but with the memory lock feature on it instead of like the older ones. And that, right. that yeah, and there he used he on that kit, stayed on that kit forever. He had all kinds of backups, but that particular hi hat stand stayed. They did not change that hi hat stand. I would I would not be surprised if that was the same hi hat stand from 1989 when I met him. That would be wow. they never stopped using. He would wear that thing. There was nothing left. Uh, Amazing. And the, and the, and the course, the Ludwig Speed King. Yeah, there's a the story about there. Speed King as well. Uh, back in, the, I guess it was the Voodoo Lounge tour, maybe the next tour after that, Bridges to Babylon, that's what it was. Uh, I got a call. They were practicing in Canada, and Chooch called me up and he says, Rich, Charlie's foot pedal broke. He's freaking out. The, the Speed King. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> the footboard had snapped in half. Oh my and gosh. Because it, it was so worn thin. I mean, it was. So he, he says, can I send it to you? You can fix it. I said, I can send it on over, you know? So he overnighted from Canada, which costs like a hundred dollars, you know, shipped the whole pedal to me. I took that pedal and shipped it immediately overnight to Jim Petty in Texas. And Jim Petty machined and somehow soldered that thing back together. And when I look, I took pictures and I cannot find them to save my life of that high, of that pedal before and after. And all the lettering and the, all those little lines that are on the Speed King, were worn flat off i've never seen a speed king so smooth because that was just, i would not be surprised if that speed king pedal was the one that went all the way back to the 1963 super classic it was worn to an inch of his life and so we sent it to jay to jim petty jim Pen petty overnights it back to me i overnight it back to canada cost like 400 500 to get all this work done by that point charlie had already gotten the other pedal the backup pedal and he got used to it and they just never used that repaired pedal can you believe that after all I, that? I, I I can't and I can, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, you fixed my favorite one? That's the yeah. one I'm going to play. Yeah. 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 <laughs> By that time, oh, even, it was like a week, half a week later, he'd gotten used to the replacement pedal and he was done. He was not going to be changed from that, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, man. I think we this covered is, all the bases, is, really, you know? Yeah, we should, we, we will definitely do a part two. This is, this has been fantastic because we, we, I feel like we've just really just, hardly even gotten into the real nitty gritty oh, of it or, or there, we certainly have a, a more yeah. to go and maybe maybe don can join us on the next one too and i hope so yeah yeah and talk about some of this stuff so um 
Thank you so much, Richard. This has been great. And, and um, you're welcome. Yeah. Do I, is there, is there a, um, can we direct people to your website or to your Facebook page or how they can contact you? If they, they can just please? contact. Yes. On, on, on Facebook, Richard King, you'll, you'll see my name on, on pop up on there. I've already during this conversation, I've probably had about five or six friend requests and some oh, emails. As well, so they've already started, which is cool, you know, and, and I really want this to be a discussion. I don't want it to be a one way thing. You and I are both very open to the idea of receiving questions and inquiries and asking stuff about this stuff. And if they have, if anybody has any pictures or insights or stories of their own, we'd love to share it, you know, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well said. And, and Dave Maddox gives us both his seal of approval. Great stuff. Both you chaps, he says. So, hey. so yep, yep. thank you, Dave. <laughs> Thanks for thank watching. You, Thanks. Yeah. And thanks, Gary. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Anthony, as always, um, hang with me for one second, Richard. I'll end the live stream and, and then we'll, we'll say goodbye in the, uh, okay. in the, in the private room. But uh, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'm going to pop this up onto uh, YouTube a little bit later. Um, we will do a part two because there's so much more to talk about. Is the book available now? Anthony's asking. Um, the Which Rolling one? Stones, you, you can buy that exhibitionism book, right? I think you can probably buy that. Uh, I bought it at the at the exhibition as while the um, exhibitionism was running, you could buy it directly from the Stone site, but I have not been able to find. I want to buy another copy. I have not oh. found it yet right now. Amazon or or Barnes and Noble, nobody has it right now. But I would try going back to the Stone site and seeing if you can find it. If there's any place you're going to find it, it's going to be on a Rolling Stone site. Absolutely, right. a great yep. book. Good and, point. And also, we, we're going to mention uh, Andy's book. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Bible, man. Andy Babiak, man, you've done a great job. Thumbs up. We use some of your information. Sorry about that. Uh, <laughs> it's a fantastic book, man. You got to get this book. It's about six inches deep and it's packed with Rolling Stones uh, information about their gear and the, and the trivia and all that stuff. Fantastic book. Thank you. Yeah, really great job, Andy Babiak. And he also did a, a book on the Beatles gear before that one. So he's 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 the man. Yeah, Andy's great. Thank you, Andy. If you're, if you see this, thank you for letting us um, share some of that information. So yeah. yeah, big hand for Richard, everybody, Richard King, my old buddy. And thank you so much. Hang tight for one second. Thanks for watching everyone. Um, please don't forget to check out the other shows on YouTube and, and the podcasts, the uh, remembering Charlie Watts episodes, and uh, we'll keep it going and stay tuned for some other um, shows with other guests in the coming weeks. So for now, Adios, and we'll see you soon.